Blockchain, blockchain security is part of the product security team at Coinbase. You can think of that as traditional AppSec applied to the domain of blockchains. Let's get right into it. 51% attacks take advantage of how a cryptocurrency network maintains consensus on the state of the blockchain and asset ownership. A blockchain is a shared database. It's stored by all the nodes on a cryptocurrency network and is accessible to anyone. For this database to be useful, there must be a way to update it. Blockchains are append only databases and are updated in batches of transactions. Each batch of transactions that are added to the blockchain is typically called a block. So you could visualize the blockchain this way. And we would expect that a block n plus one would shortly be added. Question is, who defines block n plus one? How do we determine its contents and which transactions are included? The blockchain is a shared slash distributed database, so this isn't obvious. Regardless of what the mechanism is though, there must be some way of reaching consensus among network participants about what constitutes block n plus one. The answer for how to determine block n plus one depends on which cryptocurrency you're talking about. This is a, one of the major defining characteristics of cryptocurrencies. If you see cryptocurrencies sorted into categories, major high level buckets, this is one of the main ways that they're sorted. And a lot of newer cryptocurrencies have innovative methods for determining block n plus one. We're gonna talk about Bitcoin and Ethereum and the method that they use where a node that first successfully solves a cryptographic puzzle defines block n plus one. This is known as something called proof of work. You may have heard this term. It's known as proof of work because the solution to this cryptographic puzzle must be brute forced, which takes considerable computational effort work. This is called mining. Mining a block, the term mining a block, is when a node discovers the solution to this proof of work puzzle. A key fact of this system, anyone can bring their computation to the table. And if they produce a valid block, the network will accept it and they will extend the blockchain, providing a valid block n plus one. So to reiterate that, if you can do the work, you can play the game. This diagram shows a blockchain tilted 90 degrees from the previous diagram with the blocks separated. Block n plus one will be added on top. Similar idea. As before, each block contains some number of transactions that are being added to the blockchain. The green arrow represents the canonical blockchain. That is the version of the shared database that all network participants agree represents the blockchain. I mentioned before, it's important to have consensus on the blockchain. The green arrow represents what everyone's network nodes determine are the rules on defining the canonical consensus blockchain. Ensuring that all nodes can reach agreement and eventual consistency on the blockchain is a critical component of the function of the network. So suppose some node solves the computationally intensive cryptographic puzzle I described before. It would share the solution to all the nodes on the network, which would relay the solution until very quickly all nodes on the network have had a chance to view this solution. And all the nodes on the network would validate that it's a, it's a legitimate solution and all transactions on the block are added to this canonical history of transactions. That is, it is that the transactions are all added to the blockchain. But suppose a second block is found simultaneously to this block. I mentioned before, if you can bring the work, you can play the game. So this second block maybe was solved by someone else bringing work to the network, solving this cryptographic puzzle. And it almost certainly contains, contains different transactions from the first. How does the network decide which block contains the transactions that are to be added to the canonical history of transactions? The rule is that the nodes on the network define the series of blocks with the most work as the canonical history. Each block takes a considerable amount of computational work to produce. So remember that blocks are produced by solving that cryptographic puzzle that has to be brute forced. So if either of the two blocks in this slide get extended by having another block produced that points to them, there will be more accumulated work on that particular branch. Therefore, in this case, it's, it's two to one. Uh, the fact that the branch on the left has more canonical work makes it the canonical blockchain. The block on the right is ignored and any transactions contained in it 
aren't considered uh, any of recently added to the blockchain. They're not considered part of the history of transactions on the network. This rule means that there's never a case where a block is truly finalized on the chain. So in this case, these two blocks outweigh the one on the right, two to one. Now we have a situation, four to two. If enough network participants decide to create blocks based on a certain block that may not be the most recent block in the chain, they'll eventually produce a branch with more accumulated work than the rest of the chain. At this point, those new blocks will consider the canonical history based on the longest chain slash most work rule, and they'll be considered uh, the canonical blockchain. The situation on this slide is known as a reorg, short for reorganization, because the network consensus on which blocks constitute the shared database known as the blockchain has changed. The grayed out blocks are known as orphaned blocks. This brings us to the concept of 51% attacks, the topic of this talk. Let me repeat a key fact from that previous slide. Any actor that can outwork the rest of the network is the sole arbiter of which among all possible valid blocks are the ones that are actually added to the canonical transaction history. That is, are actually added to the blockchain. This is because the fact that they can outwork the rest of the network allows them to choose any number of blocks that they want to orphan. That is to reorganize out of the blockchain. And they can do this because they have 51% or more of network mining power. So in this situation, if there were some kind of network instability where blocks were not always immediately shared across the network, they weren't propagating to all the nodes that are on a peer-to-peer -peer gossip network, or if some actor has been deliberately holding back blocks that have been discovered, we could see something like where these blocks on the left that are just out of sight for now, perhaps not shared with the network, are being grayed out. That They may be hidden from the network, but if they were shared with the network, there would be another reorganization. The network would switch over to these blocks, and they would define them as the canonical chain, orphaning all the blocks that were previously the most recent additions to the chain and are now no longer considered part of the transaction history. Because of this potential for instability in the most recent blocks, anyone receiving a transaction on a blockchain, on a proof of work blockchain network, should wait for several blocks to be found after the block that contained the transaction that they're receiving in order to lower the chance that the block containing their transaction will be orphaned. An analogy that I found interesting for this is that the most recent blocks are like recently fallen leaves in the autumn. They can blow around and change and shift and move and they're, they're not secure. After a while, they might get waterlogged and, and sit still. They don't move as much. And after a longer, they may decompose into mud. And eventually then when they've been around for truly long enough, they could become clay or sedimentary rock. Any party that receives transactions can adjust their own risk of having that transaction removed from the canonical history due to a reorg by adjusting the number of blocks they wait. Leaves, waterlog leaves, mud, clay, rock, it's all up to you as the recipient of the transaction. This amount of time that you wait is known as the confirmation requirement and each recipient determines their own risk preference. So let's imagine how this could apply to Coinbase or any one receiving cryptocurrency. We could have a following situation. Suppose Coinbase supports this fictional coin, completely made up, not a real cryptocurrency, called McCoin, M-U-H. Suppose the confirmation requirement for M-U-H is three blocks. That means Coinbase will credit your transaction, your deposit onto Coinbase's platform after three blocks have been mined by miners. Suppose also that Coinbase supports Bitcoin and MUH trading, Bitcoin is BTC. Any customer of Coinbase could have the following intention, legitimate intention, create a transaction T. In transaction T, send coins from the customer's wallet to Coinbase, wait for three blocks, after which the confirmation requirement is reached and Coinbase will consider the deposit to be finalized and credited to the account. Remember Coinbase gets to choose this level of risk and right now we're assuming three blocks is the confirmation requirement. The customer at that point is credited the MUH the MUH can be sold for Bitcoin because there's MUH BTC trading. And then the customer can do whatever they want with the BTC, including sending it to a wallet that they control. This is a completely normal pattern of behavior for a customer to take. This is exactly how a customer who wanted to sell MUH for BTC would behave. Let's imagine, however, that this customer is actually an attacker. This attacker has one key capability. They can outwork the rest of the entire MUH mining network. Remember, 
The ability to outwork the rest of the network allows the attacker to create reorgs of arbitrary depth, as I showed before. So the attacker creates transaction T, sending some amount of MUH coin to their Coinbase account. Suppose T is quickly included in a block by some miner that solves the cryptographic puzzle. Simultaneously, however, the attacker will create T prime, a second transaction. We're going to take a closer look at T and T prime. Addresses with an A are attacker controlled, and suppose address C is controlled by Coinbase. The attacker has funds in address A1, and in transaction T, which is a public transaction that everyone on the network can see, the attacker sends these funds to their Coinbase account, A1 to C. After a few more blocks are mined, Coinbase will credit these funds to the attacker's Coinbase account, specifically after three blocks are mined, because we're assuming three is the confirmation requirement. In transaction T prime, the attacker has the same funds in A1, so they're spending the same money, but they're sending it to another address that they control, A2. T and T prime cannot exist in the, in the same transaction history since they both consume the funds at address A1. As soon as one is accepted, the other is invalid. The term for this is that T and T prime are double spends of one another, same money being spent twice. But either transaction on its own is perfectly valid. The public version includes T, where the funds are sent to Coinbase, but a secret blockchain that this attacker is mining contains T prime, where the funds never leave the attacker's control. So the attacker is building an alternative blockchain in secret. The public blockchain is the version that all network participants, including Coinbase, are able to observe. The secret blockchain is only visible to the attacker. And crucially, in this secret history, there is no deposit of the funds in address A1 to Coinbase. They go to address A2. So the attacker begins to mine the secret blockchain that includes T prime. And remember, we've assumed that the attacker can outwork the rest of the network, meaning the attacker can produce blocks faster than the rest of the network. So from the perspective of the network, nothing out of the ordinary is happening. Coinbase sees that a customer has deposited funds to their account. We're just waiting for three confirmations like normal, but the attacker is not sitting idly by and is producing its own their own blocks on top of the block that contains T prime. Still waiting for, we've got two confirmations now on T. T prime continues to outstrip the main chain with the secret blocks. But eventually the main chain, the public chain, is going to reach three confirmations. So Coinbase will credit the attacker's account with MUH at this point. Then suppose the attacker sells it for Bitcoin, which can then be sent off platform. So the BTC is gone. Bitcoin's off platform, it's out of Coinbase's control. It's presumably in the attacker's control. The, attack, the, the person who controls addresses A1 and A2. Nothing publicly seen thus far is out of the ordinary. It's just a normal customer transferring one cryptocurrency and selling it for a different, different cryptocurrency, in this case, MUH for BTC. So now the attacker can, can execute the attack by revealing these blocks. It's all they have to do, reveal the blocks to the network, then the canonical history will change, a reorg will occur, and the attacker's blocks now represent the canonical chain because there is more work on this formerly secret, now public, chain that was mined by the attacker. The top three blocks that we'd seen publicly on the left now become orphaned. They're no longer part of the blockchain and the transactions defined in them are no longer part of the canonical transaction history. And notice importantly, T was within these blocks, meaning that there's no longer a transaction to Coinbase in the blockchain anymore. But you can see based on the yellow um, icon that there's the, the Bitcoin has been withdrawn already. This is the sequence of events. So there was a withdrawal without a deposit. Therefore, that would be a theft. The ability to do this is directly related to how difficult it is for an attacker to overpower the network. The key part of this attack was the assumption that we made at the beginning. The attacker could produce more blocks than the rest of the network combined. They could add up more blocks in that gray area than the rest of the network could in the white area. Note that the danger of this attack also comes when the target accepts a deposit directly from the attacker. In this example, Bitcoin was provided in exchange for MUH. If the attacker can't get something irrevocable in exchange for the vulnerable coin, this attack isn't viable. This is one of the reasons that an exchange is a great target for this sort of attack. Liquidity. I'll, I'll provide more on that later. 51% attacks are easy to observe if you're watching for them. Each block is identified by a hash, which is in some ways, you could think of that as the solution to that cryptographic puzzle that provides a unique fingerprint for the block. 
if block hashes change at different levels, then you can detect reorgs. So if the hash of block at height n changes from what it was before, then there, it must be a different block, which means there was a reorg. Small or shallow reorgs are normal. This is driven by the fact that many nodes are simultaneously attempting to find blocks, and there is some amount of latency within the network. So there will be race conditions where multiple blocks are found at the same time, but eventually only one will be part of the canonical blockchain. I described that initially in the slide with the question mark and the two blocks in a race condition. However, deep reorgs are not as common and reorgs beyond a confirmation limit of any service that's receiving cryptocurrency could allow for an attack on that service. Examining the hash of a block at heights n minus one, n minus two, n minus three, et cetera, can give an understanding of how deep or severe a reorg was. Lastly, you have to inspect the blocks to see if you can identify a pair of transactions, T and T prime, that are double spends. They're double spends if they both spend the same money, but to different places. That means they couldn't exist in the chain together. Only one of them can exist. And so when an alternative history is presented, there's a switch on where the funds were sent. And that's the smoking gun that a reorg was malicious. Money that was sent to one place originally is clawed back during the reorg, like a bounced check almost. As I mentioned before, I work for Coinbase, a major cryptocurrency exchange. Exchanges make an ideal target for these kinds of attacks. Exchanges hold a lot of cryptocurrency on behalf of their customers. That's an obvious enough reason to be a good target. The ability to trade one currency into a different currency is also very advantageous, as in that example of BTC being traded for MUH. Speed. Exchanges often credit funds to customers on a relatively short time frame. This allows for nearly instant sends, an attack that could therefore happen very quickly. The ability to get in and out fast is obviously a good thing for an attacker. Remote interaction. An attacker could potentially execute this attack from across the ocean, maybe even from North Korea. And in some cases, anonymity. That's not true on Coinbase because we require knowledge of a customer's identity. Uh, we strive, Coinbase strives to be the most trusted exchange in the cryptocurrency industry. And as part of that, we are heavily regulated. And a large part of that regulation involves the lengths we go to ensure that every customer on our platform has gone through a rigorous KYC AML process. KYC stands for know your customer. So that means knowing the identity of our customers. This is important for AML, anti-money laundering. Any exchange that doesn't have these strict requirements would obviously be more attractive to potential attackers. Let's summarize a little bit of what an attacker would need to execute this attack. Remember, I said the attack is kind of like bouncing a check. You send money to someone, they give you something exchange, but the original money is never actually sent. Or in the case of a reorg, it was sent, but then you were able to change the history to exclude the sending of that money. So the attack has two components. One is the ability to form a secret chain, which requires majority mining power. That is the ability to overwhelm the rest of the network's mining power. That would be the ability to extend blocks in the gray area on the right hand side of the slides earlier faster than can be extended on the, that white area on the left side. In the check balancing analogy, this is what gives someone the ability to actually write a check that's invalid. You could think of this as actually having physical possession of a check from a real account at a real bank. You actually have to have that in order to balance a check. Second, the attacker has to have the ability to create transactions T and T prime. You'll need some of the currency itself to do this as an attacker. And the more coins that the attacker has, the bigger the impact of T and T prime. In the check bouncing analogy, this is right, like writing a really large number on the check. The ideal victim. Well, obviously the victim must accept the currency. In the check bouncing analogy, the victim obviously has to allow the attacker to pay by check. But the victim also has to provide something of value that they cannot take back once they realize they've been scammed. In the check bouncing analogy, this would be like cashing a check. The attacker gets cold hard cash and disappears with it. There wouldn't be much point to bouncing a check on something like the down payment of a house. This means that an attacker couldn't sell the cryptocurrency like the MUH in that previous example for something like US dollars and transfer those dollars to a bank account. Not only would that expose the attacker's identity, but the bank transfer can usually be reversed. Cryptocurrencies that are not vulnerable to 51% attacks, however, cannot be reversed. 
This is why cryptocurrency exchanges make such a good target for 51% attacks. You can exchange the vulnerable, reversible currency for one that can't be reversed. Also, notice that this attack can be repeated indefinitely until the victim takes defensive action, either by raising the confirmation requirement before crediting a deposit to make it slower and more costly to create a reorg, or by simply shutting down interaction with the currency and not crediting any, crediting any deposits in that currency at all. We're gonna talk about real world examples of this happening. All that was really lovely, I'm sure, and very interesting, but very theoretical. We're gonna talk about three different attacks. Bitcoin Gold, BTG was the first major one and a Coinbase that put us on alert and said, wow, okay, this was always a theoretical possibility, but we need to make sure we're prepared. This caused us to invest in the ability to monitor for these and alert if they occurred. VTC is Vertcoin. It's the first one we observed firsthand, um, approved our ability to detect these in real time. And Ethereum Classic, ETC, we also observed firsthand on our, and it was a, a special interest to us because it was a coin that we supported on Coinbase. This has happened to other coins um, as well, but these are just three that I've highlighted. So we're going to walk through the Ethereum Classic 51% attack, which occurred um, in January 2019. Uh, because this was an asset that Coinbase supported at the time and still supports, we had monitoring systems to monitor for 51% attacks on Ethereum Classic. So the Ethereum Classic is network, the ETC network is minding its own business, mining blocks as usual, propagating them amongst nodes, adding transactions to the blockchain. Then all of a sudden, seven new blocks show up out of nowhere. And these seven blocks don't extend from the top of the most recent block, aka extending the blockchain from the, from the top block, but they dig down five blocks back, orphaning four blocks. It's very unusual for a miner not to extend from the highest block. This happened again 12 hours later, where six new blocks orphaned five previously discovered blocks. You'll notice that I called both of these practice attacks because neither of them contain that double spend, a pair of transactions T and T prime, where the same money is sent to one place in T and a different place in T prime. Thus, these incidents were just reorgs, blockchain reorganizations, but not double spends. However, we'd never observed reorgs of this depth on ETC. So we were on alert, but we couldn't say that they were malicious. However, there was another reorg three hours later. This time, 74 new blocks showed up all at once, orphaning 57 blocks. And they contained a T and T prime. This was on a Saturday night. Our monitoring systems alerted. Our on-call engineers responded. We validated the alert and disabled Ethereum classic send and receive functionality on Coinbase. This protected Coinbase from subsequent 21 more reorgs on Ethereum Classic. It protected us because we weren't crediting any deposits in Ethereum Classic. Remember, one of the things required for this attack to succeed is for the victim to provide something irrevocable to the attacker in exchange for the deposit of the vulnerable currency. Since we disabled Ethereum Classic, we weren't crediting any deposits, so we couldn't be attacked. We're gonna talk about a few patterns in the other, across those three selected attacks that I described. Blockchains are public. I've described this before, how they're a shared database. This means that a 51% attack is a very noisy attack and leaves all kinds of good data for understanding the attackers. So I'm gonna walk through some of the things we've observed. They really only scratch the surface of what you can tell about an attacker. This chart shows all 17 of the reorgs that we were able to find when we researched the Bitcoin gold attack and how much Bitcoin gold was taken in each one. Notice the first two didn't take anything. Same story with the first five in VTC, Vertcoin, and also the first two in Ethereum Classic, those two practice attacks I described. But remember what I said, a 51% attack has two parts, building a secret chain and properly creating T and T prime, the double spend transactions. So what did the attackers do? They broke the problem down into those two steps and made sure that they could build a chat, an attack chain before they bothered with creating T and T prime. Even criminals need tests. Criminals are also not perfect. These are the same three charts as before, and you may have noticed there are gaps in how much coins were stolen in each attack. That's a little hard to explain. As far as I can tell, 
the attackers did a bunch of work to reorg the chain and mine a secret chain and release it and cause all the nodes to switch over to the formerly secret, now public attacker mined chain. But they didn't put in transactions T and T prime. They did all the work for none of the payoff. For the first few reorgs, it makes sense to assume they were testing. But once we've proven that they can do it, these simply looks like, like mistakes to me, where they accidentally failed in some way to include T and T prime in their reorg chain. The invest exploit paradigm is present here. Imagine yourself in the attacker's shoes. You have an interesting dilemma. Once you have the hash power to successfully attack the network, any additional resources you have should be directed towards owning the currency itself to amplify the effect of the double spend transactions. In other words, the cost of the reorg and the payoff of the reorg are not functions of one another. So as an attack progresses, an attacker is accumulating resources. Should those be reinvested in the currency itself to make subsequent reorgs more impactful or just taken off the table? In the Bitcoin gold attack and most of the vert coin attack, attackers were mostly in exploit mode. They have X coins and they're gonna get a double spend. Every time they do a double spend, they're gonna get X payoff. But in the Ethereum classic attack, ETC, and oddly in the first three vert coin attacks, the attackers were in invest mode. This makes me think that the Ethereum classic attackers may have been planning to continue attacking because I would expect that the optimal attack profile to conclude with a period of exploit rather than invest. A few more points as I wrap up here. This, these attacks are highly profitable. This is just the returns from double spends alone. This is the profit margin, 92% profitability, 64, 77. When the attackers create a reorg, however, it means they've mined blocks, which means they can sell the mining reward, the new coins generated as the reward for mining those blocks. These figures don't even include that. However, the mining reward is valuable and leftover coins to, do typically get sold. So the attackers make the most of it. They mine new coins, they mine these attacking blocks and they have new coins and they're gonna sell those too. Timing is an interesting thing to look at. The time of day that these attacks occurred is another interesting route. This is a, 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 a visualization of the times that these attacks occurred. It's a little hard to draw meaningful conclusions from BTG and VTC. There does seem to be some clustering, but it's not too pronounced and they pretty much are operating on a 24 hour coverage. Ethereum Classic, however, obviously had a time of day as a major pattern in the attack. And that one outlier that you see is actually one of the, it was the very first practice attack that I mentioned. So it's already a different case. If such a pattern does emerge, I would have two major hypotheses about what could be driving it. The attacker's preferred waking hours or the time zone the attacker considers most difficult for the victim to respond, probably at night. Uh, also notice that the, uh, or note that the ETC attacks and most of the Vercoin attacks happened over weekends, again, probably because then that's most difficult for an exchange to respond. I mentioned how an exchange is an ideal target for this attack. Um, some targets. I've talked about exchanges. Uh, the risk for a, a, in 51% attacks is in directly accepting money from the attacker. So the attacker will be able to create that TNT prime, which will invalidate the money you received in the original T. So an attacker will want to find an exchange where it's possible to hide their identity from the exchange. So in this case, Bittrex delisted Bitcoin Gold shortly after the Bitcoin Gold dev team claimed that Bittrex was attacked. In Vertcoin, we don't know the attacker, or we don't know the victims, excuse me. And in Ethereum Classic, all three of those exchanges put out statements acknowledging that they were targets of the attack. Another observed pattern, attacks stop after they're publicized. The blue line shows when these attacks were publicized. The light blue shows the period of time over which they occurred. So shortly after publicize, publicization of the attack, they stopped. The last observed pattern, suboptimal transaction placement. It's interesting. We've noticed that attackers commonly don't place the T and T prime transactions in their optimal box. This, is, this example is a real world example from the first Ethereum classic double spend attack where 74 blocks orphaned 57 blocks. The ideal block for the attacker to have placed transaction T is the deepest block that was orphaned, which would have given the transaction 57 confirmations at the time that it was orphaned. Instead, T was 13 blocks higher where it only had 44 confirmations at the time of the attack. It was not in the deepest orphan block. 
which means the attacker did the amount of work required to orphan a transaction of 57 confirmations while only accomplishing orphaning a transaction that had 44 confirmations. This happens in the vast majority of the double spends we observed where transaction T was placed in a suboptimal block. In conclusion, I described the mechanics of a 51% double spend attack where attackers are able to outwork the rest of the network by mining more than half of the blocks. I then walked through real world examples of these attacks on Bitcoin Gold, Vertcoin, and Ethereum Classic and discuss patterns that we observed. That's it. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Um, if anyone has any questions, you can uh, write a question in group chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask a question. Unmute myself. There's a question from Rajesh. I uh, hope I pronounced the name correctly. Um, are these attacks on the rise or fall? That is an excellent question. We have not seen very many of these attacks recently, which is contrary to what I would have expected. Uh, they are quite feasible on some of the lesser known cryptocurrency networks. Uh, however, we haven't seen as many of them as we would have expected. Coinbase doesn't support every cryptocurrency. And we, the ones that Coinbase does support are more well-known than like on the more well-known end of the spectrum, right? Like, like the, the more uh, blue chip and just better recognition. And typically that means they're higher value, which means they're less susceptible to 51% attacks because the mining network is therefore harder to overwhelm. So we don't track everything. So these attacks could be happening on some more obscure cryptocurrencies. But um, I would say that like, they're not, are they on the rise or fall? Like ultimately, I would have expected to see more of them than we have seen, but they still do occur. And we still have seen them recently enough that it's, we can't say that there are like declining, but um, they're also sort of, so maybe somewhere in the middle, I guess I'd have to say. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Happy to take any other questions. All right, there are no questions at the moment. We're a little bit short on time. And yeah. if you have any questions, like in the next five or 10 minutes, you can also send a private message to Mark. And I'm sure he will be glad to respond. Thank you, Mark, for the presentation. Thank you. So, right. right, and our next speakers are Christopher and Vatsal. Um, the title is Chrome Extension Risks and You. Christopher is a security engineer who works in a red team at Lyft. Um, he enjoys breaking into systems. He does security research. He helps teams to improve their security. He worked in different roles, including AppSec, incident response, and network engineering. In his free time, he enjoys paddle boarding in the bay and growing plumerias. I actually had to Google what plumerias is. Um, am I muted or <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I wanted to make sure. Yeah, I actually had to Google what Plumeri is. And for some people who might don't know, uh, it's a beautiful uh, plant, um, flower plant. Uh, Vatsal, uh, he is a security engineer at Lyft and he's working on automation, incident response. Uh, he also worked on net network traffic analysis and threat, hunt threat hunting. Uh, his free time, he enjoys kayaking, cycling, and soccer. 
Both of our speakers are very active and outdoorsy. Um, they're going to talk about uh, malicious Chrome extensions and how they handle uh, those malicious Chrome extensions in scale at Lyft, and they're going to share um, their lessons learned um, while working with Chrome extensions. So I'll pass it to Christopher and that's all. Thanks, I'll share my screen. Is that working? Yeah, I can see that. Great. Okay, hey, uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for, for coming to our talk. Um, today, we're um, as she mentioned, we're going to talk about how Lyft addressed the risks of Chrome extensions for our enterprise. Um, this is some work that that Saul and I and a few other people at Lyft worked on together um, over the last few uh, months. And uh, yeah, we wanted to share um, kind of how we were able to sort of uh, remove this risk across uh, our, our company. So the, we're gonna go through a, a background of, of how we started this project, some of the risks involved with Chrome extensions and uh, the plan and approach that, that Lyft took. Um, and uh, as a little note, this, this talk is going to focus on Chrome browsers, but obviously there's extensions for um, just about every browser out there. But at this time we're just talking about Chrome. So how did we get here? How did Lyft come to this problem and how did we start working on this? Um, so there was some red team work that was done um, at Lyft and we noticed some sketchy Chrome extensions and um, we kind of try to figure out like how we could reduce that problem um, across the company. Um, there wasn't too much help out there when we first started looking, um, some information that Google has, um, but we sort of had to build our own system and uh, we're gonna show that today. So uh, some of the, cha the challenges you run into when trying to make a change like this across your enterprise is that employees are used to just being able to install whatever they want. And if suddenly you've managed their browser and you've blocked them from installing any extension they, they, that, that they'd like, um, it kind of can cause some friction and some complaints. So you have to find a way to manage that, that um, revolt. Um, and uh, you also have to work on uh, long-term operations because when you turn off the ability to install whatever you want, you have to go through an approval process. And uh, that takes some, some time and uh, we'll share a little bit more uh, later in the talk about how we've scaled that, that challenge. So um, I won't call out any extensions by name, but there's a few different areas that we wanted to sort of highlight um, different types of extensions that do things that are, um, I'd say like somewhat sketchy. Um, so there's some tools that do calendar type work. Um, they do things like um, optimize your time, um, but to do that, they have to have access to your email and your calendar and their policy, privacy policy states that they, they share this with affiliates. Um, these, are, these are quite popular with people because uh, people are, are busy and they wanna install something quickly to sort of free up some time. Um, the downside of these is that most all of them are free. So these companies behind them have to find a way to make money and that usually includes sharing your data or selling it to third parties or sharing um, with uh, affiliates. Um, another one is a popular spell check tool. Um, it has to have access to every website in your browser and um, hosts the data that your users are creating on their server. Um, so if you have any sort of uh, concerns about privacy, what things that your, your users have access to and them copying and pasting documents into these um, extension sites, um, you have a sort of a different challenge there with that one. Um, uh, a third one we want to call out was promo extensions. Um, this can be things that help people save money on stuff like coupons, things like that. Um, but they also can do some, some malicious things. They can be installed by users or they can be installed by um, malware. And, and those ones can be a little more sketchy. And uh, there's been a few different articles out there about these uh, malvertising type extensions that have been caught and cleaned up off the web. Um, the first one I also want to cover is uh, an article that was in Ars Technica um, in 2019. Um, this one talked about a tool or a, a collection of extensions that were mostly just stealing histories from users. And uh, the history of each user doesn't sound very sensitive, but it actually can be. Um, it can have things like um, password recovery, uh, URLs uh, that aren't, maybe don't expire. It could also have things like parameters that contain PII 
within the, uh, the URLs. Um, and through this research that someone did a while ago, they found a number of tools. And, and one of the ones that we're going to call out today is HoverZoom, um, the older one that doesn't have the plus at the end. Um, this tool was used basically just to mouse over an image link, and it would make the image full size. Pretty popular for things like Imgur and Reddit. Um, that tool itself, um, HoverZoom, it actually installed and did its normal work. And three weeks later, it turned bad and would begin to exfiltrate and sort of like encrypt your uh, history with Base64 and start uploading it to a third party server. Um, so this is another article we wanted to sort of highlight. This was from February of this year. Um, a researcher found um, I think about 70 extensions that were pretty bad. And these extensions were doing all kinds of like fraud and um, Google took the research that they were given and then found 500 other ones that were from the same group. Um, so that was another pretty sketchy one that came out. And even more recently, uh, as in June 17th, less than a week ago, there was a pretty big article that you might have seen in national news. And it talked about some work that was done by Awake Security. Um, they had found that there were about 111 extensions on, on their side that had been downloaded over 32 million times. And these extensions, uh, while had like normal uses, um, a lot of them were like search type um, tools, things that like optimize stuff. Um, but they, they sounded like normal extensions that had actual value to a user. But in the back end, they were doing some bad things like taking screenshots, reading the clipboard, harvesting your um, credential tokens and cookies and parameters, and also doing things like uh, key logging. And uh, this one was pretty massive. Um, but there's a list of extensions that were um, given by Awake Security. And um, the, the great news is that like, the, for, for us, we had blocked all of these things. So we weren't affected by this. Um, but if you have a large enterprise, there's a good chance you're going to see a number of extensions installed that um, you'll kind of scratch your head. Like, how did that thing get there? Why did this person install this? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty crazy place out there in the extension world. Um, so this is, if you've installed an extension before, you've probably seen this window here. This is what you see when you install it. This is what users look at. Um, if you click more, you see a little more data, which is being shown here. Um, so this, this extension here, while it sounds very benign and basic, um, it basically makes a new background on any new tabs in Chrome. And to do that, it shouldn't take very many permissions, but this one, for some reason, asks for the ability to read and change Google.com sites, so any subdomain of Google as well. This is an example of what the um, manifest.json file shows. And this is going to show like the permissions that the extension asks for in the Chrome API um, uh, for the browser to, to know what permissions to give it. Um, tabs is a pretty common one that we see. Um, what's not said here is it actually gives the uh, extension access to every URL, so every, basically the history as well. Um, web request and web request blocking, those are used by ad blockers um, and other things. Um, but most, like, most commonly, web, web request blocking is from ad blocks, ad blocking things. Um, the URL you see here is asterisk colon slash slash. That's going to be the scoping of these permissions, which is basically all sites on all protocols and all directories. Um, cookies, that's going to be all your authenticated sessions to sites. I'm um, obviously very sensitive. Um, if they can exfiltrate your, your cookies, the, the sessions can be stolen and reused on attacker sites potentially. Um, and histories is called out directly. And these are the rest of them are kind of a uh, pretty common but low, low risk. Um, we did a very like non-scientific study of the Chrome Web Store, and this included going through and scrolling down for about three minutes until this like never ending page loaded um, with lots of extension IDs, then parsed through it and then ran some reports against all the extension IDs. And this is sort of the outcome we saw from those 8,000 off the front page. Um, you see like lots of access to Google, access for cookies, and a lot of them need or ask for access to your, your history or get access to them. So we used a, a tool from Duo, which is owned by Cisco to sort of do some of those work at Lyft. Um, so this is kind of like how we structured the, the, how we structured how we get the data from our users and how we um, keep on top of what's being installed and also um, uh, doing the reviews and requests, things like that. Um, so the first part is the extension, which, which is inside the browser. It's called a CX Curator Gatherer. 
And uh, this tool just basically reports back to um, the Sierra Excavator site with the extension that that, that that user has. The second part is the admin console and API. Um, the API gives us the ability to programmatically access which are, what our users have installed and also do some workflow automation, uh, which uh, that's I will talk about in more detail later. Um, the third part, which was very valuable to us, was the extension reports. Um, you can give it a, an extension ID and it gives you a report of that extension. And it'll include things like which permissions it needs, sort of a, a risk score that's generally pretty close to you know, what you'd expect um, it to be. Um, but also just kind of gives you a quick view of the extension and you know, should you allow it, is it sketchy, um, things like that. Um, so this is a sample report from Sierra Excavator's report, reporting system. And this is on HoverZoom um, before it was taken down um, by Google. Um, so this shows sort of like the, the first part of the, of the, of the uh, report. The, the second page shows you the permissions that it needed. And they also give some rankings for risks for each permission that the extension asks for. And you can see here that a little tool that makes image zooming probably doesn't need access to your cookies or web requests or uh, history, things like that. Um, so other risks that you have to take into consideration with extensions that almost go outside of the, uh, that do go outside of the browser um, is OAuth grants to Google accounts. So a lot of extensions do need access to things like your calendar, sometimes your email, um, sometimes for your contacts. Um, in some cases, some will even ask for access to um, your Google compute, so GCP stuff. Um, so when a user sees this, they don't really read it. They just click next. But if you did read it a little bit deeper, you'd see that the, the, the tool is asking for the ability to read, write, delete, forward, all kinds of different things within your email for that user. Um, additionally, contacts uh, for this one here. Um, but yeah, I, I would say contacts, calendar, and email are the most popular. We also see things like Drive um, additionally. And uh, that's going to give access to these third parties through a backend OAuth grant. Now, most people don't read privacy policies when they're installing an extension. They just want to click next and get that cat to pop up on their browser. They want to see like funny cats when they open their browser every day. Um, but if you did take time to like dive into what these privacy policies say, they sound very basic and, and not very scary unless you like read a little bit closer. Uh, but this example here is from one of the more popular ones. Um, they say that they may disclose personal data that they collect about you and they will share that data with service providers, contractors, affiliates, third parties, subsidiaries. Um, the one that kind of caught my eye was affiliates because I'm not really sure, like, how do you become an affiliate? Like if I shake Vitsal's hand and uh, now we're affiliated, I'm gonna share all of your extension data that I've collected, or all your browser data, calendars, because uh, I have an affiliation with some third party. Um, We've also seen some cases where extensions are owned by one company and then a subsidiary will like re resale the data. So that's another thing to worry about. And a, a big thing to, to consider is when you're looking at extensions is, do I trust this company and how do they make money? And, and that's gonna probably give you your answer. And most of the time, you're probably not gonna want to um, approve it. Um, another one here talks about, um, you know, we will never rent or sell your data but we may share it with, and then it has this huge list of things that they'll share it with. So it, it's actually a lot worse than it sounds. And this is pretty common for most of them. And now we're gonna jump into the plan and Sal is gonna cover that part. Thanks, Chris. So um, uh, yeah, that was the extension landscape. Um, I can talk about the plan and how we um, dealt with this extension risks at our company. Um, so this is the basic like level zero plan of our extension management project. And um, like everything else, we can't fix what we can't see. Um, so we started trying to gain or improve visibility um, and then explore what's going on and uh, decided to take it from there. Um, we also needed an acceptable risk policy. So this is basically a criteria of uh, when you can allow or not allow extensions in your environment. Um, and no policy is perfect from the beginning. So especially when you're tailoring something that would potentially apply to thousands of users at your company. So we found it very useful to work closely with um, stakeholders and their like use cases for various extensions that they might use for increasing productivity of their team members. And then once we had a policy in place, we built workflows to enforce the policy. 
So this was a mix of um, technical controls and user education. And finally, we wanted to automate as much as possible. Um, this includes the way in which we do our reviews after everything has been blocked so that new extensions can be enabled and how we can reuse those reviews to do lesser reviews going forward. Um, the first piece of uh, this was to improve visibility. So in the next slide, a few, um, the most important piece was Chrome management. Um, as I mentioned earlier, gaining, gain, gaining or improving visibility is the most important step. And uh, to do that, you need to bring Chrome browsers under management. Um, if you use Chrome OS devices like Pixel Books, um, it is managed by default. But for everything else, the user can either, either volunteer to be enterprise managed by logging in into Chrome and then clicking on sync, um, or the administrator can force it by deploying a token through whatever fleet management system is being used in the company. So for example, you can use Jamf to deploy the token to all your Mac devices, or if you have Windows, you can deploy the token as a registry key through um, Active Directory. Um, the next slide shows our architecture. And uh, this is the high level architecture of all our workflows. Um, we use G Suite to push policies to our browsers. These policies are basically um, technical controls. And one of the policies that we are pushing is the CR excavator gatherer extension itself. Um, so it's, it's the extension that gives us visibility into other extensions installed in the browser. Um, additionally, it gives us information on the vulnerabilities that it introduces and the permissions it is requesting and other things. And all this information is then available via an API, which you can use for automation. Uh, so the next piece was automation. This is something that we built in house. Um, there are two pieces of this automation. One is cartography. Um, cartography is a open source project by Lyft Security, which allows us to visualize infrastructure as graphs and do correlation activities amongst various data pools. So one of the data pools that we added was the data that we are collecting through CR Excavator. So you can imagine this as being able to um, graph a user um, the team that they belong to, the manager that the team reports to, and all the extensions installed by this org, and all the vulnerabilities and um, other risks that are now that that are now that now affect this entire group of users. You can also work other way around where you have a list of extensions that you want to find. Maybe they are malicious that someone published that you know you need to get rid of these extensions, and then you can do a reverse lookup to do remediation activities. Um, second piece of this automation is enrichment and flow control. So once we have, once we are blocking extensions, we need a way for users to request new extensions. So we created some automation around collecting metadata from CR Excavator and the Chrome Web Store and put it all together in our case management system for an analyst to look at and decide whether the extension needs to be enabled. And then once it is evaluated, the final piece is the only manual task that is done in this process, which is the actual enabling of the extension in G Suite. Um, that's because there are no APIs for extension management. Um, nothing we can do about that. Um, in the next slide, I have uh, shared a little bit about our approach. Uh, so once we had our components in place, before we could enforce any policies to block extensions, uh, we reviewed the top most extent used extensions in our company. We reviewed like 1,000 extensions and additionally asked users to send in requests for things that they think are very critical for their productivity or in, in general day-to-day -day use. Um, additionally, we did some use case categorization. So uh, we don't need 10 different extensions for doing something like screenshots and we don't need 10 different extensions for ad blocking. So we would standardize one or two that would take care of the use case and introduce minimum security risk. Um, and once we were done with the reviews, we were ready to start blocking. Um, the next slide shows a little bit about our review process. Um, so once we have blocking in place, uh, we need a way for users to request the review. And we built some additional automation around it. So we were automatically rejecting extensions that fit certain criteria. We were also automatically rejecting stuff that were known that, that were found in a known bad list 
or things that we have already reviewed in the past and rejected for whatever reason. Um, we were also looking at keywords in the description and in the name of the extension so that we can give approved alternatives rather than introducing a new extension in our environment. All this ensures that whenever the IT analyst who does the review actually looks at the ticket, um, they have all the information available and the, and the extension request made it past all our checks um, and it does require some human um, interaction at that point. Um, in the next slide, there is a screenshot about what it looks like. So the end user goes to the Chrome Web Store they try to install an extension, it blocks them, it is picked up by CR Excavator and it throws a pop-up asking the user to start a review process. Uh, when the user clicks on the review process, it asks the user to send in the request by providing a business justification. And once that request is sent, um, it is picked up by our automation system, which enriches that request with information from CR Excavator and also from the Chrome Web Store. So like, basic information like what is the rating of the extension, how many installs and what permissions it asks for, whether there are any vulnerabilities that were found and links to the actual place where the user can install it and link to CR Excavator. And all this information is put together and this is what the analyst looks at to do the review. Um, yeah, so stage deployment um, before we enforced our controls for the entire company. We did a smaller deployment to about 1000 users. And this, this, this was an end-to-end -end workflow enforced for everyone in a certain high priority or a high risk pillar. Um, and we were able to bring down the total number of extensions for this group by 95%. So 95% reduced number of extensions and reduced the amount of risk as well. We also saw the entire process operationalize after a while. So we weren't um, catering to several new requests after a couple of weeks. Um, and we saw similar uh, results when we scaled up this workflow and enforcing the policy for the entire company. Um, so those were the things that um, we did to reduce Chrome extension risks. Um, what worked for us does not necessarily mean that it will work for you. There are obviously other approaches out there and Google has its own set of recommendations for companies to deal with um, extension risks. So um, the TLDR of uh, Google's recommendation is that I uh, use domain blocking and use permissions blocking and additionally have an exception list where you are building a list of extensions that are allowed despite those blocks. So by domain blocking, they mean that you can explicitly block extensions from having access to, um, for example, aws.amazon.com. And by permission blocking, they mean that you can allow users to install any extension, but they may not have access to cookies. And finally, for extensions um, that do need to run on AWS or do need access to cookies, you can build an ex exception list. Um, in our experience, we found it difficult to work with uh, permission blocking um, one reason being there are, there were workarounds for the extension to do the same things by requesting some other permission and that way they have partial access to the data. One example is tabs. So even though you block certain domains, if the extension has access to tabs, it has access to the URL that the user is visiting. You can get the same information from history as well. So URLs may contain sensitive information. Um, even if you're blocking aws.amazon.com, the URLs will reveal information like um, S3 bucket names. Um, so we found it very difficult to pinpoint permissions. Um, and uh, it, it would eventually cause admins to add more and more um, extensions to the enabled list of extensions, which is no different than having a default deny policy with a building list of extensions. Um, and finally, um, in the last slide to like wrap up things, um, there are solutions available out there that are fairly mature to bring this risk under control. And uh, there are constant up improvements being made by Google and other security vendors to have a good balance of productivity, security, and privacy. Um, and these controls do work for enterprises. Um, the 
the articles mentioned by Chris, the ones from Awake and Duo um, and Ars Technica, those extensions never made it to our list of allowed extensions because of our review process and the kind of policies that we were enforcing. Um, so yeah, in general, users need to be aware of these risks, especially because we are moving towards having everything in the browser from um, documents to chat and writing code and games. And some of these extensions end up having access to all of it. And uh, that's that's about it. Um, these are some links to everything that we spoke about in this uh, presentation. And we're open to any questions. Um, hi, Vatsal and Christopher. Thank you for the presentation. Is there a way that you could share slides? Maybe some people were asking about slides so they could access links easily. Yeah, yeah, we can um, give you the link. You can send it out to people. Okay. Sounds good. And by the way, great presentation and great approach by um, requesting which extensions are really like being used and then um, kind of whitelisting thousand like extensions and um, very limits attackers like because one of the projects that my colleagues have been working on, they actually uh, exploited a lot of like compromise a lot of users through an extension and I think if that was a lift it probably wouldn't work that way <laughs> yeah, great presentation uh, if, if anyone has any question please um, leave them in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask um, there was a question earlier from Neil um, are Chrome apps also problematic uh, I just installed Chrome remote desktop a lot of front-end developers I know use Postman. So I can share part of that. I think that's all I can answer the other part. But um, on, on if, if this is the same remote, Chrome remote desktop from Google, um, I think you can decide like if you trust Google or not on that one. Um, on, on the other side, um, Chrome apps are, are being deprecated in Chrome. Um, so those themselves are probably not going to be there much longer. And in the future, at least Chrome or Google has talked about removing them and just having extensions. Um, but uh, it would probably be an extension if they did remove the app itself. Yeah, um, apps are being deprecated in favor of extensions. Um, the, the funny part is apps, extensions, and themes in Chrome's all have an extension ID. So. Sometimes um, they are all considered to be the same thing. Um, the other part is um, to be aware of the other extensions that are installed on the browser. If you are using RDP through an extension, which does something in the browser window, there might be another extension which has the permission to take screenshots. So um, even though that extension might be safe to use, there might be other extensions with capabilities that um, could cause issues. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think like what it comes down to is like, do you trust this company with your data? Because they're likely gonna have access to it. So if you have like an official corporate relationship with like data protection agreements and NDAs, things like that, then it's not as big of a risk as, you know, a free extension made by a single person that um, could potentially uh, either be, you know, attacked by an attacker who takes over their extension or they get offered 10 grand and they sell their extension and then the person who buys it starts doing malicious things. Um, but yeah, it's something, something to think about is like, who do you want to trust with your data? Um, I see another question about um, how, how it compares against Mozilla. Um, we, didn't do a, we didn't do much look, looking into Mozilla itself, um, but you know, obviously Mozilla and Safari have extensions. Um, I know with like with Apple, they're, they're very strict on what type of extension you can create it's more limited so it's harder for people to make money with them based on the way that they've structured their their app store for them for mozilla um i we looked into like how you would um block them and there didn't seem to be a clear way to do it uh, the same way that, that chrome does um one thing you could do is is potentially like uh uh, make it so that your users are forced to use the browser that you feel is more secure. Um, I know some people like Mozilla better. Um, if you're dealing with extensions, you, you might want to look into some sort of like endpoint um, 
systems that can tell you which extensions the Mozilla users are using, even if it isn't an easy way to block them, at least you have visibility on, on what they've installed. Um, a lot of tools like a big fix or AD or um, uh, um, I can't join the other one. Um, it's different, different tools that can like run scripts on your users' machines from a, a central like, management server. Um, that's probably the way I would approach that one. Yeah, the, the tools that we mentioned are for Chromium based browsers, so it should work for Chrome and now Edge. Um, we haven't looked much into uh, Mozilla. There's another question here by Brianne. Um, so, what are some of the what are some of the criteria you use to review individual extensions? Um, so, we would look at first like, can the computer that they're using the OS that they have, can it do what they're trying to get out of the extension? Like, if it's a screenshot, can we just use the built-in screenshot tool just to avoid the tool entirely? Um, is there some free app that we trust that can run natively on the computer that can do it. Um, and then we'd also, like I mentioned, we'd look into like the relationship we have with the company. Um, we'd look into like, how do they make money? Uh, what data are they getting access to? Um, if you don't have a data privacy agreement with them, any data that they've been given is kind of like up to the privacy policy on what they do with it. Um, some extensions don't have privacy policies or domains. Google's getting a little more strict on what they allow into the web store. Um, but I would also keep into consideration that extensions can be updated. And um, some of the older ones haven't been removed for not, you know, they have a certain bar now, but the older ones are still there. Um, there's also a such thing as like remotely loaded JavaScript. So extensions can be rated a certain way with some remotely loaded code that could do something more malicious. Um, so how do you explain to it to people whose installations are limited by your policies? So we have had people push back. And when we've sort of showed them the risks and try to, we, we always try to find like a, another solution for them instead of just saying no. Um, so we spent a lot of time doing that. Um, but we, we had support from our leadership on the method that we took. So they've been able to support us when you know, people had concerns or escalations on that type of stuff. But we really haven't had too much. And we were very, as that's all mentioned, we did a lot of communications with teams. Um, we did some pre-reviews. We also um, asked teams to let us know what they needed. And that allowed us to sort of like allow in some things um, earlier on and that, that didn't block people. Um, it, it also helped us get like the most vocal people out first and helped us sort of standardize on specific extensions. Yeah, it's, it's only in the initial like few days of when the policy is enforced that users lose their extensions. That's when users request the most extensions. Eventually, once all those reviews are done, it, it fairly operationalizes. We are not doing more than a couple of reviews on a weekly basis. And with all of the work that that's all did with the automation, it definitely like speeds up the work because the, things can be automatically closed. Um, we can re re rewrite people to different extensions, things like that. So it cut the work down um, by a lot. But um, we, we took a longer approach to this. Uh, you, you know, we, we took a slower approach so that we would be able to move forward and not get blocked by complaints. But you could do this like in a very quick window, but you'd have a lot more people, I think, uh, complaining. <laughs> so it's kind of like up to you how much you how balance that. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, thanks everyone. All right, uh, thank you for the presentation. And we basically are ready to wrap up. Those were two of our talks and I always learn something new during a wasp meetups. Today I learned about um, tactics of breaking some of the cryptocurrencies. I also I learned how to to um, Google extensions, uh, preventing malicious Google extensions at scale. Um, so thank you for our presenters. Thank you for taking time from your evening to come virtually and present. Um, this is it. Uh, if some of you still want to stay here and to just 
introduce yourself to network. I know it's not the same as in person, like networking, but we still have a pretty um, good amount of people, participants, and we could introduce each other, um, just say where you work maybe, where do you live at the moment, uh, what are you interested in security particularly. Um, for those of you who are done and just wants to enjoy their evenings, um, I'll just say goodbye and thank you for joining. Um, and again, if some of you just want to stay, I'll be here for the next 15, 20 minutes.